Long ago, in the ancient Uko kingdom, there flowed a vast river known as Obana River. The river wasn't just any ordinary water body. It was home to fascinating creatures that looked half human and half fish. The mere people, as the villagers called them, had lived there for generations. Every morning, children would rush to the river bank, their small feet kicking up dust as they ran. Look, look, the mermaids are coming, a child would shout, pointing at the water where blue scales sparkled beneath the surface. The adults would gather too, watching the peaceful scene as mere people swam near the surface, sometimes waving to the humans. The fishermen would carefully navigate their boats around the areas where mere people swam and there was an unspoken agreement about sharing the river's resources. But peace never lasts forever. One fateful morning, Ike, one of the most respected fishermen in Wuku, went out early to cast his net. The sun had barely risen, and mist still clung to the water's surface. As he threw his net, they landed in an area where young May children were playing. Human, you're too close to our children, a man shouted, his voice sharp with warning. Ike pulled at his net. I've been fishing here for 20 years. These waters belong to everyone, not where our children swim. The Mayman's face darkened with anger. All the May people began surfacing, their faces worried. A young child swam too close to one of Ike's nets and became tangled. My son... A mermaid screamed, diving toward the net. In the chaos, as May people tried to free the child and Ike tried to protect his nets, something went terribly wrong. The ma child was hurt, and the angry May people killed Ike. Ike's body was found floating in the river. The news reached King Okpala within the hour. The king sat on his throne his face growing darker as the village elder explained what had happened. Your majesty, the elder finished. The people are afraid. If the mere people can kill our best fisherman. King Opala stood, his voice thundering through the throne room. Bring me my advisors and send word to every village along the river. That evening, the king made his proclamation from the palace steps. They have taken one of our own, he thundered, his voice echoing off the stone walls. From this day forward, no person shall be permitted to swim at the surface of Obana River. Any who dare defy this decree shall face immediate death. The peace between our peoples is forever broken. The decree changed everything. The merfolk retreated to the river's bottom, where they established their own kingdom under a law a strong and wise maman who became their king. Years passed, and in the underwater kingdom, life adapted to the darkness of the deep. Elo's daughter Cheta grew into a curious young mermaid who often asked questions about the world above. One day, while helping her mother Ini prepare their home for a celebration, Cheta couldn't contain her curiosity. Mother, she said, what's it like at the surface? Ini paused, memories flickering across her face. Why do you ask, my dear? I hear the older ones talking sometimes about how things used to be. They mention something called sunlight. What is it? Ini looked at her daughter. Sunlight is, imagine, the brightest, warmest thing you can think of. It's like that, but more beautiful than you can imagine. It makes everything glow with life. And the humans? Cheta's eyes sparkled with interest. What were they like before? They are different from us. They walk on two legs instead of swimming with tails. They used to be our friends long ago. The children would wave to us and we'd wave back. Then why can't we talk to them anymore? Because fear and anger poisoned both sides. Ini explained, one terrible day changed everything. Now we must stay here, where it's safe. But Cheta couldn't stop wondering about the surface world. Late at night, when everyone else slept, she would swim as high as she dared, 
almost but not quite breaking the surface. The faint moonlight that filtered down fascinated her. One morning, King Elo noticed his daughter's distraction during their breakfast. What troubles you, my daughter? He asked. Father, why must we live in darkness? Surely not all humans are cruel. Elo's face grew serious. Cheta, you don't understand the danger. The humans blame us for the death of one of their own. Their king has ordered our death if we are seen at the surface. But that was so long ago. Maybe things have changed. Some things don't change, my dear. Promise me you won't go to the surface. Cheta remained silent and her father sighed heavily. Meanwhile, in the palace above, Prince Ago was facing his own struggles. His father, King Opala, had summoned him to the throne room for what had become a regular argument. Son, the king said, I've received another message from King Madu. His daughter would make an excellent match. A ghost sighed, running a hand through his dark hair. Father, I understand, but no buts. King Opala slammed his fist on the table. Every suitable young woman in the kingdom has been presented to you. What more are you waiting for? I want to marry for love, Ogo replied quietly. Is that so wrong? Love, the king scoffed. Love is a luxury we cannot afford. We need stability. And what about my future? Ago asked quietly. Your future is the kingdom, King Opala shouted. When will you understand that? Your personal desires don't matter. They should matter to my father, if not to my king, Ago replied, then immediately regretted his words. Get out, the king said, his voice dangerously quiet. Get out of my sight till you are ready to act like the prince you are supposed to be. Seeking solace, Ego found himself walking toward the Obana River. The moon cast a silver path across the water as he settled on a fallen log near the bank. The gentle lapping of waves against the shore always helped calm his troubled mind. That's when he saw her. A head emerged from the water, followed by shoulders and the most beautiful face he had ever seen. A mermaid. Her scales had an unusual glittering blue tint. Their eyes met and for a moment... Nida moved. Please, she whispered, don't call the guards. You shouldn't be here. It's dangerous. I know, Cheta said, moving closer to the bank. But I had to see what it was like up here. Everything is so different. The air, the sounds, the way light moves. I'm Ago, he found himself saying. I'm Cheta. She smiled and Ago felt his heart skip a bit. This is my first time seeing the surface. Is that the moon? Yes, he said, pointing upward. And those are stars. They are beautiful, Cheta breathed, her eyes wide with wonder. We can see little bits of light through the water, but nothing like this. They talked for hours that night, sharing stories about their different worlds. Ego told her about life in the palace, the pressure to marry, his dreams of finding true love. Cheta spoke about the underwater kingdom, her father's wisdom, and her burning curiosity about the surface world. Hours passed like minutes. I should go, Cheta said as the sky began to lighten. My mother will be worried. Will you come back tomorrow night? Ego asked, hopefully. Cheta hesitated, then nodded. Yes, but we must be careful. When she returned home, her mother was waiting. Where have you been? Ine demanded, her face pale with worry. I, I just wanted to see the surface. Cheta, have you lost your mind? They will kill you if they catch you. Mother, maybe they are not all as cruel as you think. Not cruel, Ine's voice rose. They would kill you without a second thought. Promise me you won't go up there again. But Cheta couldn't make that promise. Night after night, she and Ago met by the river. They shared stories, dreams, and eventually their hearts. Their love grew deeper with each meeting, despite the danger. 
One night, after several months of meetings, Cheta arrived looking troubled. What's wrong? Ago asked, immediately concerned. My father, he's arranging a marriage for me, she said, her voice trembling. With the son of his chief advisor, Ego felt his heart constrict. When, in two moons time, Chete looked up at him, her eyes glistening with tears. Ego, I don't want to marry him. I, I love you. Their first kiss was gentle, tentative, bridging two worlds that had been separated by hatred and fear for so long. Neither of them noticed the ripples their love would create until it was too late. Weeks turned into months, and their secret meetings continued. But secrets have a way of revealing themselves. One morning, Cheta felt strange. Her swimming felt heavier, and her stomach churned with an unfamiliar sensation. When she told her mother she wasn't feeling well, Ines' experienced eyes widened with recognition. Your scales are changing color, Ine observed, and you've been sleeping more than you should, Cheta. Are you with child? Cheta couldn't meet her mother's gaze. Yes. Who is the father? When Cheta remained silent, Ine's voice grew sharp. Cheta, who is the father? His name is Ago, Cheta whispered. He's, he's human. Human, have you lost your mind? Do you know what they'll do to you, to your child? He's not just any human. He's different, mother. He's kind and understanding and, Cheta whispered, his prince Ago, in his face went pale. The son of King Opala, the very king who ordered our banishment. Oh, Cheta, what have you done? Devastated by her mother's reaction and desperate to find Ago, forgetting in her distress that it was broad daylight, Cheta fled to the surface. The moment her head broke the water surface, shouts erupted from the river bank. Mermaid, catch her! Nets flew through the air, and before Cheta could dive back to safety, she was entangled. Rough hands dragged her onto the shore where angry villagers surrounded her. Please, she begged. I mean no harm. No harm? A fisherman spat. Like your people meant no harm to Ike? The beating began. Fists and feet rained down on her as she tried to protect her stomach, thinking only of her unborn child. In the palace, a guard burst into the throne room. Your Majesty, they've caught a mermaid at the river. Ego's heart stopped. Without a word to his father, he ran. His legs burned as he sprinted through the village, praying he would reach her in time. But when he arrived, it was too late. Cheta lay still on the river bank, her shiny blue skin dulled with dirt and blood. The crowd fell silent as their prince fell to his knees beside her. What have you done? He whispered, then louder. What have you done? You've killed them both, my love and my child. The crowd stepped back, shocked by his words. King Opala, who had followed his son, stood frozen at the edge of the gathering. From the river came a sound like thunder, and the water began to churn. Ilo, king of the Mafok, rose from the depths, his trident glowing with power. Behind him, an army of merfolk broke the surface, their faces twisted with grief and rage ready to bat the river red with blood. Finally, it was Ini who stepped forward to broker peace. Standing before both kings, she spoke. My daughter died for love. Let her death be the last. Let her story teach us that hatred only breeds more hatred. Why love? Love might have shown us a better way. A new treaty was drawn up. The merfolk would no longer be banned from the surface and humans would no longer react with violence to their presence. It wasn't perfect, but it was a beginning. Prince Ago never married. He devoted his life to maintaining peace between the two peoples, and every night until his death, he would sit by the river, remembering the love that changed two kingdoms. Thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you in my next story.